As of the filming of this video, it's Pi Day, March the 14th, 3.14. And today we're going to look at a video where we show this interesting proof that Pi is irrational, and it was developed by Ivan Niven. The proof is quite short if you take a look at it. This is the article here that talks about the proof, and it was developed in 1946 by Ivan Niven. So we're going to look at the details of this, flushing out why Pi is an irrational number using cool techniques from calculus. Welcome to today's video, I'm Prof Omar. So today we're going to look at this proof that pi is irrational, and it involves this expression little f of x, which is a function, a polynomial, in x, assuming that pi is written in a rational way. So we're going to say pi is actually written as the fraction a over b, where a and b are integers, and come with a contradiction by looking at this function f of x that has a and b involved. It's x to the n times the quantity a minus bx to the n all over n factorial. We're also going to involve this function capital F, which looks at different derivatives of the function f and adds them up. So we're going to prove two main claims that are going to lead us to why pi is irrational. One is that f of 0 plus f of pi is actually an integer, and here we're talking about the capital F. Then we're going to also recognize that capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi is an integral from 0 to pi of the little function f, times sine of x dx. These two together are going to cause problems with the statement that pi is assumed to be rational and we're going to get a contradiction showing that the integral in the second part can be actually made arbitrarily small which is a problem if the number f of pi of f of zero capital f of zero plus f of pi is actually an integer. So let's start by proving the first thing that f of capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi actually is an integer. To do that, what we're going to do is expand little f because capital F is based on the derivatives of little f. So if you look at little f, it's a polynomial of degree 2n whose terms start with an x to the nth coefficient. So it'll look something like cn x to the n plus cn plus 1 x to the n plus 1, etc. And then we have all these denominators with n factorials up to c sub 2n x to the 2n over n factorial. And here, the information that we have is that a and b are integers. So all the ci's from cn all the way to c2n are all integers themselves when we expand the numerator of this function f of x. Now, when k is small, meaning when k is less than n, the kth derivative of this function um, at x is going to have a factor of x in it because our polynomial is lowest non-zero coefficient starts at x to the n. So when we plug in zero, we'll get a zero for the kth derivative. Now what happens with the kth derivative when we look at k greater than or equal to n? All right, we can look at a generic term of the expansion of f and see what happens to that term when we actually evaluate the derivative. So if you look at a generic term c sub m x to the m over n factorial, knowing that m is at least n, we'll be able to actually compute the derivatives. We'll keep bringing down the exponent and multiplying by successively smaller numbers. And we'll get m times m minus 1 times all the way to the quantity quantity m minus the quantity k minus 1, that's the kth derivative, all over n factorial. And we'll have c sub m retained and x to the m minus k because we're taking k derivatives. Now the numerator here has k terms. And since k is at least n, there's going to be more than n terms. And we start with an integer m that is at least n. So the numerator is going to actually have n consecutive terms, m consecutive, oh, sorry, k consecutive terms um, in it, and k is larger than or equal to n. So the numerator in this fraction will actually have n factorial as a factor, right? You have k consecutive terms as a factor of k, k minus 1, etc. So this entire thing in the, in the box, which is the coefficient of x to the m minus k, is an integer itself. 
Okay, so that tells us then that when we evaluate the kth derivative at zero, we'll either get zero or um, for the situations where we get a constant because we have no x term there, we'll still get something that is an integer itself. And so capital F evaluated at zero, which is a sum of things involving little f at zero, is going to be an integer itself. Okay, but what about capital F at pi? Well, if we look at little f of pi, little f of pi minus x actually turns out to be f of x. And let's see why that's the case explicitly. So if we were to evaluate what f of pi minus x is, it's going to involve a and b themselves because pi is actually a fraction represented as a over b. Okay, so f of pi minus x is pi minus x to the n times a minus b times the quantity pi minus x all raised to the n. But pi itself is a over b. So we get a over b minus x all to the n. Then we get a minus b times the quantity a over b minus x. And then that's all raised to the n. Okay, so we can factor out a factor of b to the n from the first term, leaving us with a minus bx raised to the n by clearing that denominator um, that we have in the first term. And then the second term we get a minus, or we get a plus bx, and then we get a minus a for the b and a over b. Okay, so this term in the second term here turns out to be bx all raised to the n. And so we get one over b to the n times the quantity a minus bx all raised to the n, and then times b to the n, x to the n. So the b to the n's cancel, and we're left with exactly f of x itself, at least the numerator of it. And so the, the denominators are constants, so we get that f of little f of pi minus x is little f of x. So what does that have to do with capital F? Well, then if you take the kth derivative of each side by the chain rule, we'll get that negative 1 to the k minus 1 times the kth derivative of f evaluated at pi minus x is the kth derivative of f evaluated at x. So the kth derivative of pi, or the kth derivative of little f evaluated at pi is actually kind of like the kth derivative of f evaluated at 0. And so capital F is going to be an integer at pi if capital F was an integer at 0. And it was. And so we do get that f of 0 capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi is an integer. OK, so we can move on to the second part. To do that, we're going to take the second derivative of capital F. And we notice if we do that, we'll get the sort of the same thing we had with F because it's even derivatives of little f, um, except we have a change in signs. Now, the sec 2 plus the 2 to the n plus 1, or the 2n plus second derivative is going to be 0 because the function is a polynomial of degree 2n. So if we add capital F and capital F double prime, um, all these intermediate terms, because the signs change, all go away, and we're just left with little f of x. OK, but we want to relate capital F to the integral of little f times sine. So it would make sense to multiply this expression by sine of x on each side. If we do that, we get f double, capital F double prime times sine x plus f times sine x is going to be little f times sine x. But we want something involving the integral here. And so what we're going to do is recognize the left-hand side as actually the derivative of an expression and then use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now to do that, we're going to introduce a term on the left-hand side and then reintroduce it in a different way by adding it to get rid of this so that we retain this thing that we actually have on the left side. So the term that we're going to introduce is something that would make the f prime sine x into the derivative of something. We can do that by adding f times cos x, or f prime times cos x. That'll look like a product rule involving f prime and sine. And then we have to subtract f prime cos x in order to balance that out. But that's going to give us an actual um, derivative, luckily. So f prime sine x times, or f double prime sine x plus f prime cos x is the derivative of f prime sine x by the product rule. Similarly, this term negative f prime cos x plus f sine x turns out to be the derivative of f times cosine x. So the entire left-hand side is f, uh, 
prime sine x minus f cosine x all prime. So the derivative of this expression in parentheses is f of little f of x sine x. And so if you want to integrate little f sine x from 0 to pi, that would be the same as integrating the left-hand side from 0 to pi. But by the fundamental theorem, that's evaluating the thing that we're taking a derivative of from 0 to pi. So we can write that function down. Evaluating it from 0 to pi will give us exactly the integral from 0 to pi of f of x sine x. Okay, now if you actually do the evaluation, it turns out you end up with capital F at 0 plus F at pi because of the values of sine and cosine at 0 and pi. Great, so you do end up with the second thing that capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi is this integral. So how is this going to get us a contradiction? Well, capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi is the integral from 0 to pi of F little f times sine x. Okay, now in the interval from 0 to pi, we know a few things about these functions. First of all, sine of x is going to be greater than 0 in this interval. Okay, finally, little f is going to be greater than 0 as well because of the way it's constructed. So, capital F of 0 plus capital F of pi is actually a positive integer. It's not just an integer. Okay, however, if we look at little f, it's the quantity x times a minus bx all raised to the n. And x times a minus bx in an interval from 0 to pi, recognizing that that interval is the same interval as 0 to a over b, is going to be less than or equal to pi times a. And if you have thoughts about why that's the case, definitely leave your thoughts in the comments. Recognizing that pi is a over b would help a lot with this. So the integral that we're interested in, because we have this bound on f, is going to be less than, or, or less than the integral from 0 to pi of pi a all raised to the n over n factorial, that's the upper bound for f, times the upper bound for a sine, which is 1. And so we get that this integral is bounded above by pi to the n plus 1, a to the n over n factorial. But functions that are exponential with bases having n in the exponent grow much smaller than factorials. So this thing actually goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So we have this function, capital F, evaluated at 0 and evaluated at pi. The sum is a positive integer, and we've just shown that it's less than some number that can be made to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. That's impossible, so there's a contradiction here, and our contradiction must have been the assumption that pi was a rational number in the first place. So a cool proof following Nevin's idea, but flushing out the details of why it works. So I hope you enjoyed today's video, and definitely want to say Happy Pi Day!